Thank you. Thanks, Armagon. I got to realize I got to shorten that intro. It tends to go on forever. Um, so uh, thanks, everyone, for coming out. Uh, I know that uh, some of you may have some preconceived notions about what the energy sector is like, what utilities are like, and maybe even what blockchain is and how it applies to the sector. So my goal today is to make you slightly less confused about each one of those different sort of, you know, areas of study or areas of focus. Um, how many of you are, are sort of know, feel like you know quite a bit about energy utilities? I don't know what your guys' backgrounds are from, a, from an undergrad perspective, but anybody here electrical engineers? Yeah? Okay, just one. Oh, all right, there we go. We've got the camera guy. He's going to be asking tons of questions. Um, okay, so I'm going to go with kind of the general overview about what's happening in the energy sector and sort of how it applies and why we're sort of, why we're here talking today about something that is, you know, historically would have been a really radical concept within, within the sector that we work in, that I'm working in right now. <clears throat> a little bit about Electra. We're, we're an LDC, and LDC just means a local distribution company. It's a utility. We take care of the last mile. So there's, in our energy sort of uh, value chain within Ontario, you've got sort of generation, then you've got transmission, and then you have distribution. Uh, we don't worry about transmission or generation. We're just kind of medium to low voltage and you know, like what we call the last mile. Um, we're one of the biggest ones in Canada who perform that function. We're one of the biggest entities in Canada that do that. Uh, we're the second largest municipally owned LDC in North America next to Los Angeles District Water and Power. So, we're a fairly big utility. And what's fun about that is that you get a chance to do projects that are pretty big and have quite a bit of impact. Um, but being in Canada, we're somewhat shielded maybe from the scrutiny that you get if you were going to be a big US utility. So enough of that. Uh, uh, this is the, 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 the obligatory uh, Electra push. Um, more importantly, I would say, you know, I, I always thought of myself, and I don't know, you guys are now going to be going off and branching off into your careers. And it's funny to think about where you think you're going to be, you know, sort of five years, ten years from now. I never thought I'd be working for a utility. Um, you know, it, historically, it had a reputation for being literally one of the most boring sectors you could ever hope for, right? Um, but you know how some people have, like, you know, poor taste in either men or women? I've got really poor taste in industry, like, just horrible. Every industry I've ever been in has subsequently tanked almost the moment that I got into it, or very close to that time. I started off my career as a developer, a software developer in AI. Um, I did that around 2002, 2003, peak of the dot-com bubble bust. Now, a software developer in AI, you get a job any Anywhere. Back then, complete disaster. I left that. I did my MBA. I graduated in 2009, 2010. Worst financial crisis in the world um, that, that we've seen in my generation. Said I wanted to get into finance. Well, clearly, a terrible idea. 2010, got into the solar business. The dot sun bubble exploded. A complete disaster. So naturally, when I found out that the utility sector was going through a death spiral, I raised my hands like, yeah, I'll do that. <laughs> That's like right, right in my wheelhouse, right? Um, but I didn't want to jump in with both feet. I wanted to make sure this industry really was doing as badly as I thought it was. So a good way to test that out is to kind of look to sort of bellwether markets. I took a look and said, where in the world can I look at the energy sector and see where it's kind of going sort of three or four years from now? Is there a bit of a crystal ball? And Germany is a really good market. In the German market, they do things, and everything you see in Germany kind of is what trickles down into sort of uh, the, the, the North American markets eventually. So I decided to take a look at RWE. That's one of the largest utilities in Germany, and this is their market cap over the last couple of years, starting from 2007. So uh, yeah, that's, that's, that's pretty telling. Um, but certainly, you know, this may have been the exception. Maybe poor management. This shouldn't sort of uh, you know, influence your view of an entire sector. So let me take a look at the actual largest utility in Germany, and that's E.ON. And uh, yeah, that's, that's not much better. Um, now, so, you know, this begs the question, right? This is bad times, 2009. Maybe the whole world was kind of suffering from an economic downturn. Uh, maybe other industries were faced with sort of a similar challenge. Um, that's Google. So... Clearly something's wrong here, right? And, and what's, what's, what's more impressive than the actual disparity is actually the time scale in which it happened. Right around 2009, all these three companies were actually clustered around the same area. And then all of a sudden, in less than a decade, you see this other company, which is a big, complicated technology company, just like the energy sector, big, complicated, lots of bureaucracy, completely make a stratospheric rise in the same environment that we all sort of existed in. What was it that made them different? Why is it that they were able to succeed when we weren't? So the answer lies in sort of a basic fundamental question, right? 
Yes. I mean, it's not fair because uh, uh, Elon cannot expand to, let's say, South Africa. They don't have. They have an unregulated arm. I mean, the, the electricity business is generally geographically lo localized. Not necessarily. Almost, our company has an unregulated affiliate. We can, I can sell beer in Morocco if I want. You really can. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah, I work for our unregulated business, Electro Energy Services. So, so, uh, so both of these are holding companies, right? So they're the energy sector, they're utility focused, and that's exactly the misconception: is that yeah, you're regulatory, you're dominated by a regulatory reality. But the truth is, the way that people consume energy is changing, and there's a real opportunity there. And we're going to get to that. We're going to talk about exactly what that means for us, right? So, here's the thing. Utilities have a bit of a protectionist view. And this is a lesson for all of you. You guys are going to graduate. You're now going to be Waterloo grads, probably the most prestigious university from a technical perspective that we have to offer here in Canada. And I don't know if ever, have, have any of you ever heard of Conan O'Brien? Do you know who he is? No, kind of, sort of, maybe. Yeah, he did a graduation speech at Harvard, which I thought was really good. And he had this saying. He said that graduating from Harvard is like getting a shiny white tuxedo. Right? It looks great in the case, but you're so afraid of making it dirty that you never wear it. He goes, from now on, when you graduate from Harvard, every mistake you make is going to be scrutinized. You, 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 you miscalculate the tip on a bill. Oh, and that guy went to Harvard. Right? You make any type of mistake. Oh, you forget a detail of somebody's birthday. Oh, and that guy went to Harvard. You guys are going to face the same problem. Oh, that's a Waterloo grad. Everyone's going to want to kind of really be, like, enjoy tearing you down and taking, like, you know, taking the, 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 the shine off of your patina. So that tends to make you fear taking risks and going out and breaking things, getting things dirty, like going out and sort of starting things and, and, and doing things in a different way. Well, utilities are kind of similar. We're so afraid of getting things dirty. We're so afraid of breaking anything. We're so afraid of making a mistake because we have these obligations. You have to keep the light on. Security is paramount. You're not going to get a bunch of guys like you have over in like, you know, Silicon Valley walking around with t-shirts that say safety third, right? A utility employee has to think safety first. So, we have this shift in mindset now that we have to take on. How do we survive in an environment where we have to be able to take bigger risks? And so the real question is, how do you build a next generation utility, right? And there's an author out there. Um, his name is Nassim Talib. He wrote a book called The Black Swan. I, I recommend you guys read it. He, he tried to answer one of these questions. What is it that makes certain companies survive and thrive and others don't, right? What is it, how do I codify these moments in time when these major shifts happen in the industry and things get really, really big and, and, and really successful? And in subsequent to that book, he wrote another book. And in the book, he asks a question. He says, what is the opposite of fragile? Right? How do you define the term fragile and what's the opposite of fragile? Fragile is basically when you exert some type of external force and something breaks fairly easily. And he posited the question, so what's the opposite of fragile? If you guys had to guess, I'll ask anybody. What's the opposite of fragile? Strong. Okay, strong. What's the opposite of fragile? Tough. Tough. So, um, both good guesses, both wrong, right? Strong and tough suggest that you can resist change or you can resist some external shock. You'll survive an external shock. The opposite of fragile is that you actually get better with an external shock. The more something tries to break you or the more likely you are to break, the better you become. And there is no term in the English language for the opposite of fragile. So he made up a term called anti-fragile, which is actually the name of the book. And I thought it was really telling because our business model right now is extremely fragile. We have one-way communication into the customer. If ever you do anything different than, than procure your energy from us, it's a very fragile business model. Our model breaks. It doesn't get stronger. It doesn't get better. So we've got to move towards more of an anti-fragile business model. We've got to take what we've got, and we've got to go from fragile to call it robust or resilient, and then eventually get to anti-fragile. We have to be somewhere along that continuum, and we're on the far left right now. right? So how do we do that? How do you do that within a utility that's, you know, major obligation is to go out and do things the way they've been doing for the last 150 years? You know, somebody in the back asked, well, yeah, you have, you know, this regional purview. How do you grow a business when all you've got are poles and wires and all you're dependent on are the electrons that, can, that, that people consume? Well, what you do is you take a look at what's happening in the industry and you build basically these little sandboxes in which you can prove out to the utility that there is a successful opportunity here. Solar and storage and the emergence of what we call DERs, distributed energy resources, are completely fundamentally changing the way that the grid works. Historically, the grid was this centralized, top-down, one-way information and energy flow model, right? A hub-and-spoke model, where there was no participation from the masses. Now, we're getting electric vehicles, we're getting batteries, we're getting solar. Things are popping up at the edge of the grid. 
that are causing a ton of problems within our network. And there's literally no way to solve them through centralized resources. Or if you do, those centralized resources will either be oversized or overbuilt for the solution they have to solve. And there's no guarantee that that solution or that problem will still exist five years from now. Imagine everybody goes and buys an electric vehicle in a neighborhood, OK? Uh, 50 people. They all plug in at the exact same time during the same time of day. They overload the transformer. Our planning team comes in and says, let's oversize the transformer. That's the idea. Let's build some more capacity. A month later, half of them sell their electric vehicles. Now, not only problems do not exist, it's actually moved. It's shifted a couple of neighborhoods over. So how do we build a system that's flexible enough to adapt to that, that instead provides you visibility into customer behavior and takes advantage of all these devices that are popping up at the edge of the grid? So our first foray was uh, into that, into discovering and understanding that was this concept called Powerhouse. I, I developed a program um, called Powerhouse within our service territory. Basically what it was, I went out to 20 customers. I said, I'm going to put solar on your roof and a residential battery in your basement. What I'm then going to do is I'm going to aggregate them, right, into what is a, called, in a construct we're calling a virtual power plant. So I found a startup out of California, out of Silicon Valley. They're called Sunverge. And they do this aggregation platform. They provide you the equipment in a box, and then they provide you the software that sits on top of it. And you build yourself a virtual power plant, a power plant based on distributed assets that does the same thing a centralized asset would do. So what is it that we expected it to do? Well, two things. You, when you cite these resources on a customer's home, they've got two value streams, right? Customers benefit. You displace a certain amount of energy. They save money. They get resiliency. They've got backup power, all this great stuff. But like I said, you collect them all into this virtual construct, you can provide grid balancing services as well. right? You can provide voltage support. You can do frequency regulation. You can do a whole bunch of stuff that you never thought was possible. Why? Because these assets were always what we call behind the meter. Anything behind the meter was this invisible sort of you know, dark area or space that we had no idea what was going on. So what we wanted to do is bring that into the light and say, OK, if you guys have resources that are behind the meter, why don't we try to exercise them or use them for what we need? And then we'll, also, we'll pay you for it, right? Why should we build centralized generation or centralized infrastructure if we've already got a distributed option out there that's sitting more or less unused for the majority of the time? So I have to figure out, one, well, how do I qualify these use cases, right? Like these, um, the utility use cases. And then how do I evaluate it? So these are the five, the, basically the five use cases that I evaluated. And these are all basically grid balancing services. No need to know exactly what they are, but they're, they're basically services on the wholesale market that you can procure um, in order to solve real grid problems, right? Here's the results from the customer side. I mean, just outstanding. Customers absolutely love this program. Like everybody saved money. They saved over 60% on their bill. They had resiliency. I had one customer who came in and said, you know what, I came in, my garage door wouldn't open. I went downstairs and nobody even knew about it. They were sitting down, they were watching Netflix. I went out, the neighbors came over, kids had warm baths, the beer was still cold in the fridge until you learn about people's priorities clearly. It's in warm baths and cold beer. And, 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 but it's, it, it gives you a sense of what the proxy is for energy. Nobody cares about electricity. Nobody cares about the generation. Nobody cares about kilowatt hours. They care about the services that energy provides, right? It runs your life. It's going to run your transportation one day. It's going to be everything that you are at some point is energy. Why not have a way to identify what behaviors you have that, that either encourage you or discourage you from using energy? That, that's kind of one of the key sort of findings that we're kind of moving towards. So that's the customer side. Great. You know, customers don't think about energy. They're going to start thinking about energy big time now. Customers don't have behind the meter resources today. They're going to start having a bunch of resources down the road, right, including electric vehicles. On the grid side, what does that mean to us? So what, what I did was, I set out a test plan, did a six-month study along with our uh, independent system operator, and I said, let's evaluate these use cases and measure them against like actual system requirements. And these were the outcomes, right? We did a demand response call. We did an operating reserve regulation service, frequency regulation. And what we determined was that on every technical parameter that we wanted to evaluate, the system worked which was kind of surprising to us. We thought we'd have a little bit more trouble. Would we get to that sort of you know, two second response time on frequency regulation? How closely would I sort of trend towards matching a signal? Um, how would I co-optimize all of these assets in order to provide a service and manage what's going on behind a customer's, like their load, and what's happening within the sort of the state of charge of a battery? All these complicated questions that I thought were gonna be a real challenge, system knocked them out of the park. What became tricky was if this were to happen, how would I go out and procure these services? Let's say this got to like 30,000 people. 
how would I engage with every customer? How would I sign a contract with them? How would I measure or verify that they did what I thought they were supposed to do? It's a very highly regulated industry. You can't just throw electrons around or sign into a sort of like a, uh, a you know a, a web interface and just you know sort of tick a couple of boxes and hope that something works. Um, this stuff has to be measured, verified, and uh, and evaluated um, to identify exactly or to 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 confirm that you did what you said you were going to do when you said you were going to do it, basically. So that's when I thought about sort of the blockchain concept. I was super interested in blockchain for a really long time. I never saw great use cases around it, right? How many of you know of what blockchain is and have a little sense of, of, of the underlying technology? Oh, wow, amazing, OK. All right, so not a popular topic, which is actually kind of surprising. Um, OK, there's a lot of hype about blockchain out in the industry, right? Cryptocurrency. Um, there is a lot of talk about you know, Bitcoin. There's a lot of talk about Ethereum, IOTA. Blockchain is supposed to change the world. It's supposed to change everything that is everything to anybody, right? Everybody thinks it's going to be the newest, greatest thing that, that anybody's ever seen. It's the new internet. Um, at its core, the ironic thing about it is that it is so simple. And for a really cool technology, it's actually a horrible engineering implement implementation and a horrible engineering approach to solving a problem. Why? Because at its core, what it involves is duplication. That's basically it. What blockchain is is a distributed ledger, a distributed ledger that sits on every single network participant's computer or on what we call their peer and, or on a node and provides some computational contribution and basically data storage, I guess, and data hosting in order to ensure that trust and visibility are distributed across the network. So it's a mouthful that I just said, but I'll explain it in a little bit more sort of you know, simpler terms. Business networks today face a, basically a unique challenge, right? You typically have someone who holds a contract and somebody who has to execute that contract and do something. Everything in between that requires a bunch of real world intermediaries to offset risk, right? The reason you need them is because nobody trusts anybody. As much as I like you guys, everybody in this room, I would not necessarily trust you if I had to do a complex transaction unless I had something in paper before that happened. And sometimes a paper document doesn't even work. I have to get it evaluated by a lawyer. Then I may need to get a banker involved. If there's a big financial sum, I'll put that financial sum in escrow. That money will only get released when certain things happen. Somebody else has to go and measure and verify that something happened. OK, so it's a big mess, right? So. What blockchain does is it says, forget about having sort of these independent, different sort of governing bodies, right? When you have all these companies and all of these different stakeholders that are constantly communicating with each other, there is a lot of um, secrecy, right? Everybody wants to sort of justify their position and their role in this entire environment. So they're like, listen, I, just trust me. I'm going to do what you said I was supposed to do. And, and you don't have to worry about it, and I'm going to store all that information somewhere. But if a ledger that, that's associated with a transaction is located on one person's computer, let's say it's an accounting firm, right? Well, then that's the point of failure. If someone wants to change a transaction, they break in, or they get someone's password, they go in, they change the transaction, they get out. From then on, that transaction has been changed, and you've got fraud that occurs. Well, what if you had a different approach? What if you took that ledger? And you distribute it across thousands of participants. And not only that, every time a transaction was generated, every time you said that you know, here are the terms and the contracts for a transaction, and here's what it takes to settle, you would submit that to the entire network of computers. And you would ask them to confirm whether or not these different sort of requirements were fulfilled. And how do you do that? Well, you all agree that you're going to solve a really complicated math problem. That really complicated math problem is going to take into account a couple of inputs and parameters. Some of those input and parameters are going to be terms of the contract. Oh, did I get this signal from this sensor? Did I have this happen you know, in this order? Did it happen at this time? Did it happen according to this person who's identified through a cryptographic identi identifier? All those parameters get put in. But then the key is they also add another element to it. They take the output of the transaction that came before it and add that as a parameter to the, to the math problem as well. So you now crunch all of these different inputs. You put it through what you call a hashing fun function, and it spits out basically a hexadecimal string that represents that transaction. If everybody in the network, or technically 51% of the people in the network, get the same outcome, 
They'll raise their hands, you get what you have consensus, what we call consensus. When everybody reaches consensus, you put the block on the chain. So now think about how hard it is to, to hack a concept like that. Not only would you have to, if you wanted to change a transaction in the middle of the chain, not only would you have to go in and get access to that one computer, you'd have to get access to every computer in the blockchain network, and you'd have to not only hack that transaction, you'd have to hack every transaction that came before it and every transaction that came after it. It's the only way to commit fraud within a blockchain environment. So in and of itself, this is what one of the biggest and most powerful elements of, of blockchain is. It's called, what we call immutability. A blockchain is immutable. In fact, if you have to delete or change transactions on anything on a ledger that you're storing or on a distributed data store, this is not the one for you. You can't use it, right? It's just it's impossible. God himself cannot change it. I mean, that's a little facetious, but for all intents and purposes, it's pretty impossible. So what's interesting about that is that if you can prove that, and you can implement a concept called a smart contract, which is also one of the endemic sort of characteristics about blockchain, well, then you solved a lot of problems, a lot of real world problems, right? You've solved the problem of the intermediary. Now, if you have these contracts that automatically execute because they're tied to real sensor data and you can prove that that sensor data came from something that's cryptographically identified, and that you can prove that that like, adhered to the terms of a contract because everybody in the network told you that it did, well, then you've got this really sort of streamlined process of fulfilling a transaction, right? And what's crazy about it, it's one in which everybody has visibility. So, it's impossible to like, you know, sort of commit any sort of fraud or to suggest that there's what we call information asymmetry, that one person knows more about another when it comes to a transaction. So there's also this, con this, this, this concept of provenance where you can trace back, since everything is stuck in the ledger forever, you can not only trace back that the transaction happened, you can trace back exactly who did it and how. And the issue of provenance is going to come into play in just a second, especially in the energy sector, because it's really important and it unlocks a really cool application for me. So, there's a whole bunch of different flavors of blockchain. There's public blockchains, private blockchains. I'm not going to get into it, but you know, our implementation is in our private blockchain. It's a Hyperledger fabric managed by the Linux Foundation. It's a very cool concept, very cool uh, uh, implementation of, of the distributed ledger technology. Um, but I don't want to get too far into that. Um, we can talk blockchain all day long. But really, the question is, how does this apply to the topic that we're discussing today, which is really the energy sector? So. We talked a little bit before, right? let's backtrack now. Now that you guys are fully enthusiastic about blockchain, I could see it, everybody's about to jump out of their seats and be like, yes, blockchain's the best. I'm gonna go out and I'm gonna do something with blockchain and I'm gonna solve the world's problems. So um, we, we went back to the original sort of you know, use case that we were talking about. A bunch of distributed energy resources in our network. How are we gonna contract? How are we gonna manage? How are we gonna do all this stuff with all these different players, right? So now that you know a little bit about blockchain, you see that it becomes a bit of a natural fit. What I wanted to do was say, okay, Let's park the technical stuff for a while. Let's park the, the, the whole sort of can these assets physically do what I want them to do. Let me find out if I can build an end-to-end -end platform that allow me to procure these services, contract for them, measure compliance, and settle them financially. So all of the stuff that has to do with the real world contracting for energy services. Can I do it all? And can I do it all on one platform that is flexible? I can do one thing one day, and then I can quickly change parameters. I can do another thing another day. Is that possible? Because right now in the energy sector, it doesn't exist. Not only that, I don't want to just confirm that somebody did something. I want to know exactly how he did it. Did he do it using a natural gas generator? Did he do it using solar? Did he use it using solar? Like, how did he do it? How did he, I want to qualify the service, and I want to understand the provenance of where it came from. And then finally, and this is the most interesting piece for me, that it's different from how we typically contract the energy services, uh, the energy world typically contracts for market services. I don't care about having a customer, like to force a customer to fulfill an obligation and say, you have to do this at this time and this time. I want to be able to model his behavior. I want to be able to say, here's an incentive. Here's a reason to do something. Are you going to do it? Yes or no. And if you do, I'm going to reward you for it. And if you don't, I'm not going to punish you for it. I might move on. But I'm going to try to find a way to basically shift what I do today, which is acting as like a steward of poles and wires, to basically becoming a broker between incentives and behavior. That's really the big shift that we're kind of talking about in this space. So enough of that. Let's talk about a little bit about how, or let me show you how this all kind of works. Anybody who's got either uh, an iOS or an Android device can play. And I'd like you to go to this URL. I'd like you to navigate to this URL. It's also on um, the board over there on the right-hand side. So you open up your web browser, navigate to that URL, 
And then once you do, just, just, just hang out there for a second before, uh, before, before kind of jumping the gun. Um, here's a visual representation. It's kind of like a little SimCity sort of model of uh, the energy sector as we know it today. Okay? The reason that all these houses right now are kind of grayed out is because it represents the fact that there is no bi-directional communication amongst energy participants or like customers and the utility or any other stakeholder for that matter. You've got a couple other players here too. You've got this natural gas generator that's firing up some, some chunky, some, some, some black smoke. Um, we've got the independent system operator here whose job it is is to balance energy supply and demand in a network. We've got a financial services provider in this model. We're going to be calling them Interact for now because they're one of our partners. And then we have an aggregator. In our case, I'm going to call us Electra. This is us. This is an LDC. But basically somebody who aggregates a bunch of these different sort of players together and creates that virtual power plant construct that I talked about. So those of you who are playing, you're going to see a screen like this show up. And you're going to go through an onboarding process. You're going to quantify the size of your, the size of your house. You're going to enter your name and then make sure you change your avatar here because everyone's going to have the spiky guy otherwise. Click Save. Pick a neighborhood. And then we are off. OK. So once I click Get Started, I'm now a player on the network. And we've got a couple of others that are coming up. So already this is pretty cool, right? So what I've done now is I now have visibility into what's happening on my network, right? Already a step up from where we were before. I know that you guys are, exist. I know that you are communicative. I know that where you live, and I know where in the node you actually are, which node in the network, rather, you, you actually um, are, are a part of. Um, and all this locational information and, identify, and, and identification information is really important for us. And we've never had it before. As a utility, we've never known who you are or what you do. So now, how would we use that information, or how would we use that data to our benefit? Well, there's a couple different things. Right now, as you can see, you don't have any way of actually contributing or actually in interacting with the grid, right? You're just an existing sort of player. But now what we're going to do is we're going to adopt a couple of technologies. We're going to adopt solar, for example, right? This will give you an option to actually sort of you know, uh, be a contributor to some type of service from a capacity perspective to the grid. There's a little memory game that you can play um, in order to actually sort of achieve this upgrade. Um, I'm going to skip through it for the sake of time. Uh, but, uh, but effectively, as you, and, and those games will get harder and harder, it's meant to represent that there's a little bit of sort of, you know, uh, there's a little bit of a barrier to entry when it comes to actually adopting some of these technologies as a residential customer. But so I'm going to add battery storage, and I'm going to add, um, I'm going to add my solar, solar panels. OK, so now I'm a player in the network. I'm saving money. I'm sort of you know, hunky-dory. I've already got a whole bunch of benefits. I've got you know, outage protection in the case that the grid goes down. Now we're going to simulate something that's you know, akin to some type of you know, grid disruption. right? We're going to basically forecast. The ISO is going to forecast that, OK, 24 hours ahead, something's happening, and the demand for energy is going to be greater. So now you saw my energy forecast kind of drop. I'm in the moment, I'm in a situation where I may have a shortfall in terms of capacity. So what my aggregator will then do is notify my participants of a shortage. And on your screens now, you're going to see this notification come up. You pick the resources that you want to contribute, and then you click Submit. So now what that means is you've identified yourself as a participant, and now you see this adverse weather event, right? Big snowfall, one of our generators went down. And then all of you guys that decided to participate automatically start dispatching. And when you do that, we actually pay you. Your energy savings start ramping up. We pay you for that service. So end to end, this is already an incredibly, this is already an incredible leap from where we exist today, right? What I just did was I procured a service. I contracted for it. You all said that, yes, I opted in, and I wanted to do this, and I was ready to do it. And I settled for that transaction the instant that it happened. I measured that you all decided to contribute. So we have these sensor data that we've simulated within the, uh, within, within the interface. And I said, as long as you are producing energy from the output of your inverters, we are going to continue to pay you. I did that all with the click of a button. In the real world, this is incredibly difficult to do. In the real world, what you do is you hand a paper contract to a customer. They sign it. They send them back the, the signed agreement, potentially reviewed by a lawyer with your bank account information there. 
Then an, a, a market call will happen. When that market call happens, you have to submit your meter data to the ISO. The ISO then takes your meter data, first validates whether or not the meter is where it was supposed to be and is an actual participant, then goes through all of the meter data to show and prove that it did what you said it was going to do. And if all that checks out 30 days later, they decide to cut you a check. So it's like 60 days between which a market call happens typically in demand response and when it gets settled. It's a long time. And it's also very prescriptive, right? It's very tightly bound. Yeah, sure. You mentioned that there is, with a, with a platform like this, there's increased visibility yeah. in the resources on, on, you know, on, on, on your system. Yeah. Uh, now, when it comes to the vis visibility, like in, in the other way around, from, yeah. from the client perspective, yeah. is there, is, isn't there a negative adverse effect given the fact that they have that increased visibility also now that getting these updates that they're constantly giving up there, that they, they have more insight on yeah. how, like, and how do you manage that? How would so there's a couple of things. One, we want them to have more visibility. Like I want customers to understand exactly what are the problems on the grid and what are the network issues that they're actually solving. What I don't want is if I'm doing a competitive market procurement, I don't want them knowing what the other bids in the market are, right? So that they can game the system. So what we have is that in the permissioned architecture that we have, the nice thing about Hyperledger is that you can control what visibility you access and grant to each one of the different participants. You have it in a, in a mechanism called channels, right? So you have different channels amongst different peers, and these different channels can expose different variables to different customers. Now, the trick about this is that most people see blockchain as this like disintermediating technology. It's all based on this somewhat anarchistic view of the world, that we don't need a central authority for anything. This is where Bitcoin came into being, right? There is no central banking authority that controls the, you know, the, the, the value of Bitcoin. The market dictates it. And that was part of the, the, the appeal. Not so in the model that we've developed, right? In the model that we've developed, we're what we call network founders. And network founders, there can be one, two, three of them, but they're basically peers in the network that define what the terms of the smart contract are and define who has visibility into what. So if you're gonna be part of this trusted network in a, in a permission blockchain environment, you have to be okay with that fact. You have to be okay with the fact that there are central authorities that kind of control the management of your data. Yeah. And essentially, we thought that was, you know, we're yeah. like, oh, this is a great idea. It gives them a lot of visibility. Gives yeah. Them, you know, you know they're, they're going to trust us. And yeah. Then, but the adverse effect was the concerns and the issues they brought up, some of the, <laughs> the, the nuisances that, you know, that. Oh, for sure. And then, and then it's just a matter of, like, okay, well, maybe increased visibility. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, in the energy space, a little bit of knowledge is a very dangerous thing, right? Like, I mean, the more you give, like, the more empowered you get. Which is, I mean, but it's okay. Like, I mean, we'll get to that. But I think the other thing is, is, again, we want to move customers away from thinking about energy as sort of this transactional back and forth between them, themselves and us. Like, we're kind of the central authority, and you're just someone who either, like, you have no choice, right? You just have to, like, buy from us, and that's it. Yeah. So that's where, like, that power struggle gets a little bit difficult to manage. What we want to do is completely turn that model on its head and say, we're just purveyors of services. All we're here is to broker, and the reason we want you to have visibility is so you have the most informed decision on what you want to do. And don't take it from us, take it from wherever you want. But if you're going to use our platform to do it, then ideally we get a cut from it, right? So we're shifting our, our view, like our viewpoint, right? We're almost like a marketplace of energy services now, as opposed to this really prescriptive poles and wires company that says, I'm just delivering electrons to your door. So, so here was a concept, and, I'll, and, and so there's a little bit of a, a twist on this concept as well, right? So settling in cash is great. Everybody loves cash, and that in and of itself is a really powerful thing. Again, the dynamic contracting is really important, instantaneous settlement, and the reason we're able to do that is because we enrolled Interact, right? Interact now manages payment rails, and it manages actually financial transfer rails, right? So we were able to actually expose some of the APIs and their sort of token services, their, their, their TSP, a token service provider. So we were able to generate a token requester that allowed us to do all this stuff in the background that didn't require any sort of intermediation by anybody else, which is great. Then we want to take it one step forward. So what if we're going to actually compensate customers not only in cash, but let's use something that is, represents a tokenized value of, 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 of energy, right? And what we did is we, we came up with this concept called energy coin, right? So now I'm going to do the exact same sort of process that we did before, and I'm going to sort of submit my same resources, and I'm going to wait. And what you're now going to see is this, this window that came up that's called energy coins. So the reason that we do this 
is when you compensate a customer in cash, and there's only one thing that you can represent with that cash, which is just basically the fact that they did something and the cash is there, right? When I use energy coins, and as you can see the coin value go up, I can also represent their behavior as a digital asset, right? So think of a toonie, right? In the center of the toonie is a cash value. Surrounding the toonie is what I call the residual value, which represents how you did that behavior. So if I asked you to perform or provide some type of capacity, and all of you saw, there's, like, there's smart lighting here, there's solar, there's storage, there's anything that you have that you want. Um, if I measure or I can quantify how you did something, well then I can quantify the CO2 benefit that that generated, right? And if I quantify the CO2 benefit that that generated and it's digitized in a digital asset, you can actually market that value separately from the cash value that you obtained. The cash value was something that you did and has, was a service and you did something of value for me. How you did it is your behavior and you should own that data. And if you own that data, you should be able to sell it to someone who thinks that's important, right? And how do people think that's important? We decided that we were gonna open up this marketplace. Exactly the same as what we were talking about the, or exactly the reason again why we picked Interact. I'm gonna open up an electronic shop, I'm gonna open up a bank, I'm gonna open up a coffee cafe. And now what happens is you get this, this, this merchant network within our, within our game effectively that allows you to trade what you've got in terms of energy and, uh, and demand for just basically common goods. Um, call it like you know, a, a latte or uh, you know, a, oh, and this all obviously reset. Um, so the reason that we do that is again because if you had Walmart one day decide, for example, that they wanted to, let me just open this first. If you had Walmart decide one day that they wanted to, and here you go, the, the, the marketplace opens up. So if you had Walmart decide one day that they said, look, I want to incentivize EV drivers, for example, um, to, 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 to control their behavior for whatever reason and sort of you know, contribute to more EV penetration in the world. And in order to do that, what I'm going to say is all of you participants in this energy network, if you allowed the utility to control the rate of charge on your EV, I'm gonna give you $1.50 for every token that you generated as opposed to just a dollar. And that 50 cents is only gonna be usable at Walmart, right? Now, what you also do is you create a little bit of competition. Then TJ Maxx turns around and says, oh man, I really also want that same affinity, that same brand affinity, but I'm gonna to have to spend more now. I'm gonna have to spend $1.75 in order to attract that customer to come to my store. So what you create it as more of like an open sort of market-based competitive concept to allow end merchants or market participants to procure GHG or any type of energy service or any type of behavioral attribute that you want to assign yourself to. This is very different than how the market exists today. If you want to get like CO2 offsets today, you've got to go to a carbon exchange, you've got to register as a participant, you've got to find another generator, and then you, once you get it, you get this sort of like, eth like a, a ethereal thing. You get basically a number on a dashboard that says, yeah, you procured this much CO2. Nobody ever knows if it's true. Like you have no source of provenance. You don't know, you can't trace it back to actual behavior. You don't know what amount of CO2 they've actually displaced. It's all just very, very opaque. Um, in terms of what we're actually sharing in that uh, distributed ledger, mm -hmm. it, it would be only, would it be only the, these digitized behavior tokens that you talked about, or would it be consumption? And yeah, so what we store on chain right now is we, is, is we so, we procure, I don't know how many sensor readings, it's every 15 seconds we get sensor readings from each one of the different devices that are there and those are all going on chain. Um, so we store the consumption data, we store the smart contract terms, we, we store the identifier for that asset. Um, we store like sort of like the, 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 the coin provenance, so where did things come from, the coin balance, everything that is to do with a customer's sort of profile is stored on chain. So now in, in, previously in the, in the, I don't want to say arcade framework. Yeah. Yeah. 
No, it's not. And again, that information is it's not private. Like, so there's no data that resides on chain. It's the access to data that resides on chain, right? So you have these quantifiers that say, this is what you are, this is who you are, these are the parameters that we're storing. But if ever you want access to that data, the data still resides in a secure data repository somewhere, right? So that's exactly, in our case, Amazon Web Services. So this is all cloud-based data storage, but the access and the permission that you grant is always sort of uniquely sort of stored on the chain. Yeah. So, so this becomes a very powerful concept, right? Now you've created, like I said, an open marketplace for, 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 for merchants, for vendors, for anybody to come in and say, I want to incite a certain behavior. And not only that, I want to sort of parameterize their behavior and, and the outcomes that they had. And I want to be able to sort of incentivize these customers and pay them for, for, for changing how they actually act and when they do things. So that was kind of like the, 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 call it the demonstration version of what we've done. This is the production version, right? So we've actually built an app. We've built a native Android app. It's called Spark. We're evaluating three different use cases right now. One is this management of EV charging. So again, that example I had about not overloading a transformer. Um, we offer customers the ability to widen the amount of time during which they offer control of their EV asset to us so that we can manage the charging and make sure it doesn't exceed a certain threshold. We've got a GHG reduction play, which basically what we've done is I think is really cool. It's like a pay for performance GHG model. Typically, when you have an incentive for solar right now, for example, somebody gives you $12,000 says put solar on the roof, all of a sudden they, they pat themselves on the back and said, I saved this much CO2. The truth is you've only saved CO2 if the energy you've dis been displacing from the center of the grid came from a dirty resource, right? If the grid energy was based on nuclear, wind, or solar, then you're generating solar, you've displaced nothing. Right? So this allows you to provide a way more strategic way of defining that. What we've done is we've created a proxy for what we call the grid heat rate. We actually scrape the ISO's website every hour to find out what assets are generating at any given time, and we turn it into a heat rate. So you know, there's basically this conversion of energy into CO2. And we then, once it exceeds a certain threshold, um, we trigger an activation signal to everybody who's participating and say, can you fire up your solar or your storage or whatever or curtail in order to displace actual CO2? So again, a really cool concept because in the renewable energy credits world, this is a big deal. Finding out how much CO2 you've actually displaced is really important because that's the value of your credit. That's what you're trading on an exchange, right, in, in the world today. Um, and so we found a way to actually tie that provenance back to some central sort of dispatching authority um, that gives you a lot more sort of uh, accuracy on what that, uh, that actual volume of CO2 displacement is. Um, then we have this grid balancing function. Really simple, we have a capacity or congestion problem in our network. I dispatch, are you guys going to be willing to solve it, yes or no? So in each one of these cases, customers go in, and as they change these preferences, what happens is they develop new smart contracts, right? So there are new contracts. Every time you change the behavior that you're sort of supplying into the system or quantifying to the system, you're entering into a new contract with the utility or whoever's procuring the service. Here's the kind of standby view that tells you at a snapshot what your preferences are, but at any time you can take that drop down menu, you can change the different parameters. Here's the active screen that shows you, okay, if an activation signal has been generated, how far are you along from completing that service and how many tokens are you gonna actually be compensated for? And then you have your spend tab, right? So this is all gonna be on tap to pay. So you have an e-wallet, you've actually got sort of you know, tokens sitting in, your, in, a, in an account that, that are tied to currency in an account um, and you can tap to pay uh, at any merchant anywhere in Canada. So this is one of the really cool aspects or features of the, the, the platform that we have. You get an activation signal, you click yes, the activation is done or the, the sorry, the, the market service gets completed. Instantaneously you can walk over to Walmart and you can tap to pay and buy something like sort of like right within the three or four minutes that it takes to get you there. Um, again, a very unique concept when it comes to settling market market services. We get a history of where you spent your money, how you spent it, and also what source of generation you use to generate those tokens, right? We talked about that provenance play. All of that data is extremely rich. There are merchants out there that would pay a lot of money to try to figure out exactly what those motivational behaviors are and how they translate into incentives. Whole other data stream that we as utilities never even saw before. All we were concerned about was driving electrons across poles and wires. Now we're seeing something in which we can actually take behavioral data and find a way to market that. So again, to the question that came up earlier, how as a utility do you expand your, your, your revenue if you're tied to a geographic location? Well, this is one. We've never monetized data before, why not? 
So where are we at right now? We've completed the minimum viable product. We've done, this is a collaboration between us, IBM. We've contracted IBM to do the implementation and we've partnered with Interact to provide the financial services. Um, the, the asset or the, the, the digital asset is gonna be in production at the end of the month across 20 customers. Um, well, our pool of 20 customers, about five have subscribed right now. We've kept a very closed, uh, a closed loop beta. Over the next 10 months, we're gonna productionalize it and we're gonna turn it into something that we're gonna be able to, dis to distribute across Canada and across the world, hopefully. Um, we're looking for new partners. We are looking for new employees, most likely. Um, if this goes the way that we want it to, we're going to need new talent. We're going to need new developers. We're going to need new product managers. We're going to need new everything. So if any of you know anybody or you yourselves are interested in something like this, then it'd be, um, I'd definitely be worthwhile to reach out. Uh, you know, part of the reason that I do things like this and part of the reason why I, I enjoy engaging with, I think, with, with, with students is that, again, there's a misconception, I think, about the utility sector. And for the most part, there are utilities that are very much more traditional than we are, right? But what I'm doing here is I'm kind of building and incubating a little startup within a utility. You've got all the air cover of having this very stable sort of, you know, oversight that's not going anywhere, that's not going to disappear. And I've done that. I've done the startup world and I've done it and I've you know, lost a lot of stomach lining going down that route. Now, what this allows you to do is kind of recreate a lot of that sort of excitement and a lot of that upside potential, um, but within a way more stable environment so that you're not, you're able to focus all of your energy um, on the more meaningful job, which is to develop the product and develop the market. Um, so all that to hopefully sort of change your view about ever wanting to work at a utility or work for a project like something like this. I think there are things that are exciting about it. I think there are things that will keep you sort of, you know, at the cutting edge of whatever field that you're in. Uh, blockchain is brand new. There are very few industries out there even contemplating doing this. We, we've actually become the first production environment that has actually put real blocks on chain in IBM's Bluemix platform. Um, we beat a lot of other big companies to that bunch, and I can't mention them, but they're huge. Um, and, and we were in front of the pack. I mean, who would have thought, right? Um, so, uh, so that's it. You know, I'm happy to answer any questions and, uh, and, and, and certainly keep in touch after the, the lecture is over. Yeah, that's kind of what we've hoped. We've hoped that it is relatively intuitive. Again, like the way that, so you saw the onboarding process. That, that's the actual onboarding process, right? There is an amount of customer education, right? And it's funny, I think, uh, so my brother-in-law, he works for uh, Samsung and he works as, he leads their product for Samsung Pay. And, um, and he told me, you know what the hardest part about, uh, about deploying Samsung Pay in Canada wasn't about even teaching customers, it was about getting them to download the app. You know how hard it is to even just get a human being to download an app for any reason whatsoever? Don't underestimate the difficulty in that, right? So I, there are challenges here, right? Um, what the hope is, is that energy is such a foundational, fundamental challenge facing our sort of world right now. It, uh, this is one thing that genuinely keeps me up at night, right? It's one of the reasons I was so attracted. I, I joked about being attracted to broken industries, but the reason is that I think about where this sector is going and how broken it actually really is and what an impact it's going to have. We're headed for a complete disaster in the energy sector, right? And this is not fear-mongering. Like, this is genuinely the, the problems that we see on our network. If even slight modifications happen in these adoption rates, if just like two or three, four, four more percent electric vehicle penetration happens two or three years earlier, we are kind of in a dire situation, right? We've got nuclear refurbishments that are now gone by the wayside that are gonna be retired. There's a big capacity problem happening. It's happening faster than we think it's going to, right? So, so we've got all these big hairy problems and we're just one little sort of sector. This, uh, across the world, it's even worse, right? So how often do you get a chance to actually tackle something like this. And historically, the mechanisms of doing it have been so brute force, they've been so top down, they've been so restrictive because they didn't, there wasn't this problem to, ha to handle, right? Um, we kind of knew how customers were gonna consume energy back in the industrial revolution. It wasn't that complicated. Um, but, but now it's, it's, it's entirely changing. So it gives us this, this really cool opportunity to interact. So, so my answer to your question, which is a little bit long-winded, is that the more I think, um, importance is, is communicated to customers about the value of energy and what, what it's about, the more proactive they're gonna become. Um, and I think the more educated they're gonna become. And then learning about these tools will only make that understanding, I think it will facilitate that understanding, make it a little bit easier. That's the hope, yeah. 
with what you're showing here and with the pilot you've done, a lot of it is distributed resources, like you said, to solar, to batteries, and so on. Yeah. On a larger scale deployment, how do you see that going? Is that something that potentially the utility is now going to own those assets, like the solar and so on? Uh, ties back to your traditional model yeah. of, uh, of an asset rate-based asset building model, yeah. or is there some sort of incentive you're going to give to the customer to yeah. put those assets in yeah. place? So this is my point of view. I have to say that I have to qualify this statement that, that this is you know Vikram Singh talking, not necessarily electric utilities talking. Look, I think asset ownership is kind of a dying model. I just don't see it being something that down the road makes a lot of sense. Why? We can't control how competitive this market gets. We can't stop anybody in this room from putting solar on their roof under a certain sort of threshold. We can't stop any of you from buying an electric car. We can't stop any of you from buying a battery. So we won't have control over assets, right, at some point. And so do we really want to get into a space where we're competing against other third parties and independents to own assets and to operate assets? It's not that easy, right? It's actually kind of tricky. The better bet is for us to leverage what we're good at, which is establish partnerships and to act as an authority of trust. And when we do that, what we do is instead of installing hardware and installing and owning assets, the idea is we would define the terms for market services and products that do the same function that those assets would have done. So our job then becomes, again, to just act as brokers. We're like, okay, we need this much energy at this time during this, the, you know, during this season, for example, at this node in the network. Now, we don't care who does it. We don't care how it gets built. We don't care who owns what. Here are the terms for which we, we, we need this service to be fulfilled, and we're going to make sure that those contracts are managed, and we're going to and we're going to get paid to do that. We're going to get paid to act as the service provider. And everybody knows in this day and age that the service business is way better than the hardware business. right? You can make way more money. It's way more scalable. It's way more efficient. And it just takes you from one view of the world to a different one. So that's my view. Is there, and I, I hear you on that part, but is there a little bit of a, a catch going back to what you previously said, where the grid's in serious trouble yeah. right, worldwide? Right? Yeah. And if you're relying on others to put those assets in place, mm -hmm. regardless of who those others are, yep. isn't there, there's a risk there of those assets don't get in place to meet the problem that you have today? Quantify it. No problem. There's a risk in everything. Talk to anybody who trades commodities on a market. Talk to anybody who trades in you know, the stock market or in equities, right? Risk ex exists everywhere. Talk to the ISO. The ISO has capacity risks all the time. The difference is they quantify it and they mitigate against it. So I'm not saying that this is the be all and end all. You gotta hedge against this problem, right? There's never gonna be one problem to the energy solution in the energy world, right? But if you haven't even quantified your risk, if you haven't run stochastic analyses and time series analysis over different variations of what load growth forecasts look like, what impacts are gonna be at different parts of your grid, then you're not only going to be procuring the wrong service at the wrong place, but you're going to be, you're going to have this huge blind spot as to what the risks are of non-compliance and non-conformance, which you can hedge, right? And then the idea isn't to say that you have to go this way. It's going to make sense in some places, it's going to not make sense in others. But at least get to the point where you can quantify that. Get to the point where you have the tools and the capability and the knowledge and the internal resources and the training to look at the problem a different way. And that's where it's going either way. Whether we like it or not, it's going to happen. Right? Yeah. Um, I had a question about the, sure. uh, about the role of trust in blockchain. Yeah. Um, as you said, the, just now you said that the um, role of the utility would be going from uh, uh, a trusted broker yeah. uh, rather than being a supplier of energy. Yeah. So if it is a trusted broker, which is being trusted by the bank, by the customers, yeah, sure. everybody, then why do, you, why do you need a blockchain? So you, your database is presumably trusted by everybody. So the distributed database architecture, right? The big challenge with that is one, settlement is very difficult, right? It's still going to say, face the same problem. When you have to connect and, 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 and basically um, develop an architecture that's based on distributed databases um, to marry the financial services world with the energy world and connect the two, the settlement piece, the actual financial settlement piece becomes very difficult. Contracting doesn't exist. Automatic or smart contracting doesn't exist within a distributed database architecture. Neither does necessarily this issue of sort of, you know, distributed, I guess, you know, so, or, or distributed immutability, right? There's ways to secure databases. There are. Now, if you are only going to procure and contract for one market service, one market service alone, 
I would say a distributed database architecture is the way to go, right? Why not? You would build the the centralized, whichever. Sure. What's wrong with the eBay model for Electra? Well, eBay is a financial services platform that relies on existing sort of platforms and programs, and they just stitch them together, right? That's You've got an existing, no, it's not. So what we're doing, like, no one's ever created a sensor database that measures the outputs of what's happening on an inverter for like a solar platform, right? Or aggregating that all into some type of repository that in and of itself has a tie-in to energy services contracts. Right? The contract for eBay is very simple. You pay me, I ship you something. It's done. That'll never change. That'll never change in eBay. That's it. That's, that, that's, the, that's the deal. Right? Now, if somebody you know, sort of doesn't get a shipment, well, you have to find a way to reverse that transaction. But it's still, it's still the same contract. This has like 15 different parameters in a single energy service potentially contract that may even change two days from now. And not only do you have to manage that contracting, you've got to take that contracting and you've actually got to add a level of procurement and visibility to it that you don't need in eBay. eBay is completely anonymous for all intents and purposes. You don't need to know the exact ways that somebody buys something or the exact ways that somebody actually purchases a good or service or that, that product is fulfilled. You can, it's interesting information, but you don't need it. We need it. We need to have that visibility, right? So if you were to build a custom-built, single-source, single-purpose architecture just for a single sort of market service, that's how they're doing it today. That's the way that the energy world works today, right? The ISO goes out, again, paper contracts, does an RFP. Or, you know, so an RFP goes out, says how much capacity am I going to get. Once that RFP clears, they go out and they sign contracts with off-takers. Those off-takers then register their devices, or they, re they register as a market participant. Then they submit their banking data. Then they submit their meter data. So the process is there. It's just clunky, and it's complex. And if you wanted to manage it on a distributed architecture or even a centralized database architecture, it would be fine. But if you ever had to change that, God help you, right? Like, ask SAP what it costs to add a column to a database. Ask them what it costs to modify a single parameter when you have this complicated, inherent, endemic structure. And I'm not crapping on SAP or Oracle or anybody. It's just not flexible. Like, it's not designed to be, right? And, and that, that, that's kind of like the, that's where it gets exposed a little bit. So again, I think for a single purpose uh, sort of function, that's a good way to go. When you need something that's this dynamic and this adaptable, I've tried it, you know? I tried to procure it. It was just, it was very hard. Yeah. No, there's definitely, there's definitely going to be a hybrid. So there are like three models that are being thrown around in the utility world today. One's called a DNO, a distribution network operator. One's called a DSO, a distribution system operator. And one's called an LSE, a load serving entity, right? So these are three little, mo these are three like main models that utilities are contemplating. Nobody's going to go all in on one or the other just yet because it's just too early to tell, right? You want to be flexible enough to, to adapt with the way that the world's actually going to work. Um, but you got to pick a direction to build capacity, right? Like you kind of have to go with a vision in times like this to build towards something. And then if that changes, you pivot, right? And maybe it becomes a hybrid, right? There is a very po a good possibility that maybe we don't own our own generation right now or we don't own assets today, but we may want to at some point. Talking about, I guess, I have another question for Yeah. From a residential time of use, um, that's kind of set by the OEB. OEB. Yeah. Their, their kind of mandates and their rules are adjusted and flexible and dynamic. Yeah, for sure. So there's, there's two ways that that can work, right? One is the highly regulated way, and one is the more sort of like less regulated way. If you want to pay customers, if you want to vary, so right now the energy sector is kind of, it's, it's a weird way of implementing a pro or solving a problem, right? Um, 
We have regulated rates. So everybody in the residential market kind of pays the same rate. It's time of use, but we all are kind of on the more or less the same sort of rate code, right? That rate at the time of day that you're consuming is completely disconnected from what it costs to produce, generate, to generate that energy and deliver it to your house at that time, right? The two are actually completely separate, which is weird, right, when you think about it. Why is it that when you actually procure energy, you pay for it according to a different rate? And the reason is people like stability, right? And the energy markets are volatile and it's very hard to sort of hedge against that. Okay, fine, so I get that. But what you wanna do is at least move towards a model in which the value of energy is more tightly coupled or the cost of energy is more tightly coupled to its value at a specific node in your network. If it's a very congested area in the middle of downtown Toronto, energy might have to be more expensive than if you're up in Thunder Bay. It just happens to be the case at a certain hour of the day because it costs you more to solve that problem somewhere else, whatever it might be. So the OEB is already moving towards it. They call it locational marginal pricing or LMP. Now LMP also can have what you call a distribution adder added on top of it. It's just a marginal additional benefit that says, okay, we have a core problem we have to solve. Everybody else, if you've got a resource that wants to contribute, we're going to give you a little bit extra as a, as a rate rider on your bill to help solve this problem. So they're contemplating those pricing structures right now, and we have to advocate for it. Ideally, if we implement it on blockchain, the OEB becomes a peer on our network, and so does the ISO. But you know, we're talking about further down the road. This is like five years away, right? For now, the way that you get around that is you don't pay customers for energy. I'm not paying a customer for the kilowatt hours that he's giving me. I'm paying for to have the option to be able to control his asset, which is very different. That's a service, right? It's not paying for electricity. What I'm doing is I'm paying for the option to exercise an asset, and then whether or not that asset does whatever it's supposed to do, that risk is on me. Right? I'm controlling it. The customer has no risk. It says, I've given you control over my EV and you're paying me $5, that's it. Whether or not you actually solve the problem, that's your problem, right? I have no obligation to like, fulfill the problem and if it didn't work, for whatever reason, I still get paid as a customer. Very different than the way energy markets work today, right? Energy markets today, if you sign a contract, you better deliver and if you don't, then you're kind of screwed, right? You get a penalty. So that's the way we're trying to like, you know, sort of manage the transition from a, from a regulatory perspective, is that we're compensating customers for control, and they don't have an obligation to fulfill a contract, but they're giving us the option to, 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 to control a service or to implement a service.